So we're finally on the map, ready to talk about the exciting stuff. Supply. Let's start with supply. So similar to Unconditional Surrender, it's kind of hard not to be in supply in this game. And the reason is, is because the Germans can use the dark gray line that you see over here as supply. Any route to the dark gray line as supply. And the Allies can use the blue line on the other side for supply, which goes almost, I mean, across the map. So you're talking a very long length of supply. Um, in addition to that, you could use any full supply sources, which is an Allied-controlled port city for the Allied units, a Allied-controlled city in Holland for the Dutch and Belgium units. Uh, you can also use Belgium itself. Switch units have a supply symbol on the reverse side. If they have that, they're always in supply. And then you can use the map edge hex. So in the French game, you don't have partial supply, but in the Polish game, you do. So check 12.3 for rules associated with that if you're doing the Polish game. So obviously, it's going to be hard to block supply from, I mean, just massive uh, section of the map. So the, in order to do that, special conditions need to occur. So first off, you can't trace supply across an enemy zone of control, which is pretty standard. So he needs to reach supply over here to the dark line, and he really can't get to it. For We'll just use the dark line, for example. It's probably a poor map placement. But he can't get to supply, for example, because of enemy zones of control. So if an enemy zone of control is present, he cannot get to supply. Now, that's assuming that he doesn't have a friendly unit inside of the enemy zone of control. So I'm not sure how that applies rule-wise, if the unit needs to be here or unit needs to be here, but basically, if you have a friendly unit within the zone of control of your enemies, then you can trace supply. So I guess he just grabs the MREs and then hands them over to you. I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't say the distance or anything, but I'm just going to assume if you have... Um, a, a buddy in zone of control, you're able to trace supply in that direction. So what happens when you do run out of supply? So here we have a tank. It has six movement, five attack, six movement. And let's say the tank has a low supply condition during our supply check phase. It's a tiered system, pretty much like most games. The first indicator that you will have will be a low supply indicator. And that basically means that you have, you're running out of food, water, ammo, whatever. And now in this condition, you can only move three hexes. So even though I have a six, I can only move one, two, three hexes, for example. So that's how low supply um, is affected. Also, if I get killed here, I will go into the surrendered units instead of the destroyed units. And why is that important, or why do you even bother tracking things like that? Well, um, let's see, no British units are eliminated. Where's the one with surrender? So right here, for example, you have a goal. This is the secret cards, you the plan card. You have a goal, at least six allied units are in the surrendered box right here. So a, an effective way to achieve your plan out the plan card could be to choke off supply from the various units. So then once you choked off supply, now you can eliminate them and they go into the surrendered box. That's why that's important. And the next condition, if you're already in a low supply condition, in the next check, if you're still out of supply, now you go to no supply. So no supply, again, it's a tiered system just like most games. No supply, that means that your movement is now reduced to two hexes instead of three. And you also now have no zone of control. Uh, and again, when you're eliminated in combat, you're going to be put in the surrendered box. You can't do multi-hex advance after combat. You don't receive an armor bonus. Even though you are armored, you do not receive an armored bonus and no supply. And if all defending units are no supply then uh, the attacker gets a two-column shift to the right on the CRT, which is huge. 
So um, you cannot do Blitzkrieg, etc. So check 12.4 in the book for full length of the no supply conditions. So now what happens after the no supply and you come back to that? Well, if you're already in no supply and you have a supply check and you're still out of supply, you're going to go to the surrendered units box, which again is important for things like the plan card or some other cards maybe. So it's sort of a nifty strat there that you have if you just want to completely choke off supply for some units in order to uh, get some bonuses. So let's talk about movement. Movement is pretty standard. Just like most games, you'll have a movement allowance on the right here. And you'll see that for this unit and that unit and this unit. So for example, this unit can move three, has three movement allowance. This unit has six and this unit has four. The red is a special meaning. We'll discuss that in a minute. But let's do these for example. You have three and you have four. Now, obviously terrain will affect movement, right? Running across an open field will be much easier than running up a mountain. So we have the very standard terrain effects chart. So here you have movement points. Is it, uh, do you have more than one armor? Defense shift, stop advance, impassable, non-terrain effects charts, etc. The book fully explains all of these. I'm not going to go into detail on every one of them. But basically, different terrain will give you different movement. So, and I mean, obviously things are going to affect movement. For example, let's say a river, right? So you have a river and you need to cross it. In most games, you're going to have some type of penalty for moving across that river. Going through woods will be more difficult than open terrain. Uh, etc. etc. So you need to consult the movement effects chart when you start to move your units around and to see how far you can move them and how much of this three allowance that you can use. So some markers will affect movement. For example, let's get a regular movement. For example, low supply will reduce movement. No supply will reduce movement even further. And if you have a no actions on your unit, that will reduce your movement normally down to one. So even though I have four allowed with a no actions, it's reduced to one in most cases. So a lot of these different markers will have different effects on your movement. So again, low supply, you can only move three hexes. No supply, you can only move two hexes. And no actions, you can normally only move one hex. So here we come to the super fiddly, super fiddly part of the movement. And I'll put this on screen so you don't have to read. I don't have to show it to you, read everything. But basically countries have movement restrictions. Some countries you can't enter at all. Some countries have conditions to enter them. Some countries have conditions to pass through. It's, it's a mess. I won't go over this, but just be aware that if you're moving into a country, you probably will need to consult the book in order to find out what type of restrictions you have for moving around. So let's talk standard zone of control rules. Very standard, except for one thing. If you're not familiar with war games, zone of control means that a unit has control over the one, two, three, four, five, six hexes surrounding them. In other words, you can't just walk past it. So if a dude's sitting out there and you just sort of walk past and sort of cruise past, go, hey, and you keep going, he's not allow you to he's not going to allow you to do that. He's gonna start shooting or attack you or something when he sees you and you get in this zone of control. So basic rules of zone of control, you have to stop. You can't go from like here to here because you're moving from his zone of control to his zone of control again, and that's usually not allowed in 90% of the games. Okay, so a different rule here is it costs one extra movement point to move into his zone of control. So if I have three movement, for example, and I go one, two, sorry, if I have three movement, and I go one, two, three, I can't do that because it costs an extra point to move into the zone of control. That's different than mini games. So instead I would have to go one, two, three, 
and that would account as extra because it's in his zone of control. So standard movement about getting out of the zone of control. If I want to go back into the zone of control, I could move here and then here type thing. So you have to move out and then move back in. But keep in mind, that's going to eat up all three movement points because you have one, two, three. So that's into his zone of control. So here's a fiddly zone of control rule. If an allied non-mobile unit in other words, this, an allied non-mobile unit enters a zone of control after moving more than one hex. Then he gets a no actions marker at the end of the movement. So basically, so more than one hex. So if I move from here to here, then I wouldn't have to be no actions. But if I move here to here, then I would have to be no actions. I'm assuming that means because the, your infantry and it was a long journey and I guess you're tired, but no actions is obviously not a good thing to have on your units. So uh, part of the strategy could be to just move here and stop and then next turn go here and then you would not have to do that. I don't know, but non-mobile units get an extra disadvantage to uh, basically, uh, basically rushing in to attack. So now let's talk about everyone's favorite subject, stacking. What is the stack limit? Generally, it's two. That's it. Generally, it's two. Obviously, there's some exceptions. You have this unit, which is an envelope with a pre-stacked symbol. So it's two, um, it looks like two envelopes. Let's get it near the camera so you can see. So you'll see you have an envelope stacked with another envelope. Basically, that is a pre-stacked unit. So if you have a pre-stacked unit, you cannot stack another unit on top it's because it's pre-stacked. So that's the only type of stack that that unit can have. Otherwise, it's two unless, unless it has an asterisk next to the unit type symbol, and then that's called free stacking. So if they have the asterisk, then you're good for free stacking and you can exceed the two stack limit. Um, obviously the same type of rules as other places. You can't stack two completely different nationalities together and things like that. But in general, the answer to your question, how big of a stack can you have is two. So finally, let's talk about combat. What you're going to be doing all day. French and Polish fronts, no retreat, CRTs, there's a few. I'm sorry, there's more than one. It's not unconditional surrender. We have one nice table. So you have different types. German mobile, what is mobile? We'll talk about that in a minute. Allied mobile, prepared combat, what is prepared combat? We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, fortress combat and blitzkrieg assault. Blitzkrieg is a whole another topic on its own. But basically you're going to use multiple CRTs based upon the situation. So first off, let's go over the colors. This is your attack power. If it's white, that's no attack. If it's yellow, that's a weak attack. Black is a standard attack. And this red on your movement means it's a mobile unit. So mobile units have a different combat table than regular units. So there's rules associated with that as well. We'll go over those. But remember, white is no attack. Yellow is weak attack. Black, standard attack. And if you're red on movement, that means you are a mobile unit. Now, there are different types of tanks. There's not just one tank. Let's review all three. So now there are three different types of armored units. You'll have one with a red border. You'll have one with a black border. And then you have one with a green border. So I've zoomed in. Hopefully you can see that. It's kind of hard to take the green. Just If you don't see red or black, I mean, it's green. Kind of hard to see the green unless you have your glasses or whatnot. But these are the Panzer tank units. So um, the Blitzkrieg, the Blitzkrieg Panzer tank is the one in red. So these units have an attack 
bonus column shift on your CRT when using mobile combat or Blitzkrieg Assault. So if you do Blitzkrieg Assault or you do mobile combat, then they're going to have a advantage and a shift. Again, here is your mobile combat table and there is your Blitzkrieg Assault table. So those are the Blitzkrieg Panzers. The regular Panzer is the one with the black border. Now the regular, uh, the regular Panzer does have an attack bonus column shift on the CRT when using prepared combat. So here is your prepared combat table. And these are no combat versus Blitzkrieg. Prepared combat is the black and that's the regular Panzer tank unit. Now the green one is the light Panzer tank unit, and these have no column shifts whatsoever. Now note that any defending Panzer tank will cancel the column shift on the CRT. So what is a Blitzkrieg assault, you ask? That's basically German units, only German units, that are under a Blitzkrieg marker can perform a Blitzkrieg assault. Now. There's certain limits to that. Again, it's only German units. All of the attacker's hexes must be under a Blitzkrieg IM, in other words, the marker, and it's forbidden against hexes containing a fortress or a no mobile blitz terrain hex or hex site. So let's talk about combat. Our hearts are ready. Our minds are ready. Let's attack. Let's get them. So now, look at this. I have five and four. That is nine. I'm going to attack this guy. He's only three. That's a three to one odds. I have no river. I have no restrictions. It's going to be a pure attack, and it's going to be beautiful. Three to one on the combat table? I'm going to destroy this guy. So what do you do? Well, you put out a shock Target are a target. There is the shock target, and there is the target. Basically, you're going to target a particular hex. So let's say, for example, I put out a target, and I put it out on him. Now, the non-phasing player, in other words, the defender, could put out a counter blow, or, or shock counter blow, or a counter blow marker on the particular hex that they want me to attack. So why is that important, you're asking? Well, look at this. This unit, this unit is six. So instead of three to one, now I'm doing nine to six. That's only gonna be one to one odds. In addition, he is across a river. That's gonna be a, a bonus penalty for attacking across that river. So this is a beautiful situation where you've just really hosed the strategy on targeting this guy and you're forcing to target on this guy. So that's what a counter blow and a shock counter blow does. It forces an attack on a particular hex. Now keep in mind, you're not attacking a particular unit in that hex, you're attacking the whole hex. So if I had this, a six and a three, and that is totaled to nine, you couldn't just attack the three unit, you would have to attack the entire contents of the hex. So that is what counter blow would be useful for, is to force you to attack disadvantageously against another opponent that is not helpless or has better defense or has better odds. That is what counter blow and shock counter blow does. So assuming the counter blows are not in the game for now, for this particular thing, I declare that I want to do a, this is called a voluntary attack, against that particular unit and that would begin the combat so who can't attack for example units with a white combat strength we went over that before units with a no actions marker on them we went over that before um, regional units doing a no deployment turn event etc so i believe there's pretty pretty few units that can't do a voluntary attack so you can't just plop down a counter blow immediately upon doing uh, the attacking phase or whatever. There's all sorts of rules. I put them on the screen. 
Um, I mean, basically, you have to get a card and discard it. Um, one card from your hand for each target hex that you want to counter blow. There's all sorts of limits. Um, I'll put them on the screen. Basically, um, you need to think before you do your counter blow strategy. So like most games, there are quite a few things that can shift the combat table to one side or the next. You have, there's so many, I can't even fit them on the screen. Check 14.6 section, page 18, for all of the whole two pages worth of things that will shift uh, combat, the CRT, the combat table, combat results chart. So, a few of the tokens, um, you have terrain effects, you have, um, yeah, you have endless supply of things. So, you can also look on the terrain effects chart, where you have a shift for mobile, or you have defensive shifts, and it will tell you uh, are the variety of different um, terrain types, the dry, if it's impassable, these terrains, those terrains. It will also tell you about the fortified hex side, and of course, things like uh, no supply, a fortress, enemy zones of control, and things like that. So you're definitely going to need this chart, this handy chart, to determine shifts. So you obviously probably know what a shift is, in case you don't. What is a shift? Well, let's say I'm attacking this unit here. Uh, sorry, let's say I'm attacking this unit here. So he's a 2, and I'm a 5 plus 4, a 9. That's 4 to 1 odds, greater than 4 to 1 odds. So let's say if I was doing a mobile combat for the Germans and attacking, we would have 4 to 1 odds, which would be right here. And now I roll a dice, and let's say the dice is a 6. So 4 to 1 odds, then I would go down to the 6 and correspond that with a 4 to 1 odds. Now... If I have a shift, in other words, maybe I have, let's say, a blitz or something that was shifted to the right. So now instead of 4 to 1, I would have 5 to 1, which wouldn't matter in this case. Defender eliminated and defender eliminated are the same. But let's say you had 3 to 1, and now it's uh, DD, which is defender destroyed versus Defender Eliminated, or let's say Defender Shattered, or Defender Retreat. I mean, as you go farther right, it gets worse for the Defender. So shifting from 3 to 1 to 4 to 1 is a, is a huge deal. That's really good. And it will also make things like, if you rolled a 5 instead of a 6, that shift will still give you a Defender Destroyed, even across one shift. So obviously shifting right is better for your attacks. Shifting left is better for their defense. <coughs> so after combat is over, you have the combat results chart. And there you know where to put the unit. For example, the defender could retreat two hexes and puts a no actions marker on one stack. And then the attackers can advance. Defender retreats three hexes. Defender, etc. Each defending unit goes in the surrendered units box. You have a variety of things that can happen in the uh, attacks. So advance after combat means, let's say we cause this guy to retreat two hexes. So he goes one, two, for example. So he retreated, all right? Let's say straight line, one, two. So he retreated. At this point, we can move into the hex that he originally was sitting in. Now, there are sorts of rules about um, multi-hex advances. If you're an infantry, you can only do a one-hex advance. However, if you're mobile, you can do a two-hex advance. So instead of... So if we here and we attacked, and then he retreated, this could do two hexes as well as it ignores zones of control. So if we were here and we attacked and he retreated, then we could do two hexes and we ignore the zone of control of the other guy that's there. So if your units are under a Blitzkrieg marker, you have certain advantages. One is you can ignore 
enemy zones of control and do a blitzkrieg move which is just moving from here to here. So I can completely ignore enemy zones of control and I can move one hex. Another thing I can do is a Blitzkrieg Assault, which basically you, um, you start ignoring things. Like you don't have to put uh, an attack marker. You don't have to put an attack marker. Um, you don't deal with counter blows during a Blitzkrieg Assault. And uh, if all the units under the Blitzkrieg are tanks, let's say, or mobile units. So let's say we have two mobile units. We do a Blitzkrieg. Now we get one free shift to the right on the combat table. Now, a Blitzkrieg table is going to be different than the regular table. So the Blitzkrieg assault table is at the bottom here. It means all of your units are under a Blitzkrieg marker which they are, then you get to use this. So you'll notice this is different than the others. In the others, we have a counter blow and a counter attack required type things. And you'll notice that's missing from the Blitzkrieg assault table. So in addition to uh, no counter blows, no counter attack required, you get different results based upon your die roll. So this is kind of cool, um, something different. So if you want to do a Blitzkrieg, you can do that, and you can get different results. Now, I do notice that, let's say we're doing German Mobile, and we have a Defender eliminated on a 4-1 to one with a 6. If you go to the Blitzkrieg, even if you have Mobile, if you have a 6 and a 4-1, to one, it's a Defender Retreat, which is worse than a Defender eliminated. So, eh... I'm not sure about the value of this. Maybe there's something else I'm missing, but the Blitzkrieg, other than ignoring zones of control and not having to deal with counter blows and counterattacks require and things like that, eh, I'm not sure this is all that valuable. At least, I mean, to me, maybe there's some other meaning. So just a note on, speaking of which, the counter attack and the counterattack required. Just a note on counterattacks and counterattack required. What does that mean? That means, let's say, I attack this guy right here, and on the results table, I get a counterattack, a CA. So that means that the battle becomes a no effect. In other words, he didn't take any damage, and there basically is almost like there was no battle. And a counterattack has no effect. At the end of that, we could just end it. I could just be, all right. This person took no damage. Or I could immediately turn and attack back at this unit. So if the defender counterattacks, you start removing any support markers. Um, if you have markers on there that were supported, you remove those. And you uh, start the battle over again, but from the other side. And another interesting thing, if there are terrain elements that affected the battle, no terrain column shift modifiers are used during that counterattack. So that's basically it. Um, you can look in the manual for things like victory conditions, um, some of the special cards, some of the forts, uh, rules, and things like that. But that's pretty much a good introduction to the game, and it kind of gives you a feel if you would like this game or not. So I hope this has helped you. Uh, if you like the video, please subscribe, hit the like button down there somewhere. And I really appreciate you watching this video. And I hope somewhere it helped someone uh, come to appreciate this fantastic game that I really like called No Retreat. The French and Polish Fronts.